Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today for an awesome episode of Native Plants at Noon. My name is Sydney Ross, and I am so pleased for our conversation that we're going to have today about grasses, rushes, and sedges. Oh my. So before we jump in and discuss several species today, I first want to thank our sponsors, the Missouri Department of Conservation and viewers like you. Thanks to the Missouri Department of Conservation, they encourage folks like us to get out in our community and explore nature firsthand. And it's because of viewers like you, we are able to bring forward educational content like this. We have a couple program announcements to go over before we dive in. I am super excited to announce our Deep Roots Habitat Garden Tours presented by the Goddermeyer Family Foundation. You can join native plant nerds and enthusiasts and see incredible gardens all over the Kansas City area every second Saturday, starting April through October. You can register today in the link that I will drop here in the chat momentarily. Our next webinar is also very exciting. Our Lunch and Learn on the first Thursday of April, we will be featuring Cedar Niles with Johnson County Parks and Recreation District. Uh, tune in if you want to see a really cool local woodland wonderland. Uh, as you may know, springtime is where it's at in our local woods. And I will be joined with guest speaker Drew Dobler. I hope I got your last name right, Drew. Uh, he is one of the natural resource technicians with Johnson County Parks and Rec. He's awesome and has so much insight on how this landscape has been protected and managed uh, with natural resources and JCPRD. And if you enjoyed that episode, you can join me in person for a guided natural walk the following Saturday, April 13th, or I guess it's right the Saturday after the webinar. Um, if you want to take a walk and nerd out about all the cool native plants and fauna that we see out there, I think you will have a blast. So please join me on Saturday, April 13th. There are two sessions for you all to enjoy. So I will also drop that link for registration in the chat here in just a moment. And I also want to mention our wonderful Work and Learn Gardening Days are back. They start up next week. I will be leading five uh, garden tours and uh, landscaping work days each month at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. And this is a great way for you to learn about how to garden with native plants as well as uh, learn empowering skills, have fun with other folks who are just as excited about native plants as I am and as you are. Um, so whether you already know how to garden or you are just getting started, this is a really great opportunity and there's lots of different topics we'll be covering over the coming months. And of course, this webinar will be recorded, will be recorded rather, and all resources will be available on our website. And I will also email you all a uh, link with resources for today's show. So keep an eye out for that. And if you have to duck out early, don't worry, we will get that over to you ASAP. Um, but please visit our website and YouTube channel to see our entire archive of episodes. But please stick around today for this program because we have some very exciting um, things to discuss. And you all love her, you all know her, Alex Daniel, Missouri Department of Conservation, Native Landscape Specialist. What's up, Alex? Hey, everybody. <laughs> she will be joining us at the end of today's program for a live Q&A. So you know you've got questions, so bring them, put them in the Q&A. Um, and if you are enjoying the show, uh, say so in the chat, and we look forward to talking with you all um, here after this. Okay. So let's go ahead and get this show on the road. I hope you all enjoy today's episode of Native Plants at Noon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Native Plants at Noon. This is Alex. That's Sydney. And we have a great episode for you today. Grasses, rushes, and sedges. Oh, oh my! my. <laughs> <laughs> We're really looking forward to um sharing some cool plants that we like to use here in the landscape at the Discovery Center. Yes. And uh, yeah, lots of good plants to talk about. Yeah, so there are so many sedges, 
rushes and grasses that we could talk about today <laughs> but today we're going to focus on some that are more commercially available so some species that you can actually plant in your garden if you want some really weird niche <laughs> carrots <laughs> talk there are other places for that we can link you to those <laughs> absolutely let's dive in with our let's first go. one all okay. right so you may have heard the rhyme sedges have edges rushes are round grasses have nodes all the way to the ground and I want to just show you that visual so that um, you can kind of understand what we're talking about as we look at these different species. So we'll start with our sedge. So this is a piece of palm sedge, and, which is a great um, plant for semi-wet to average soil. And notice this triangle shape here at the base of the cut. And if, as I twirl this piece through my fingers, I can feel it has very distinct edges, three, three to edges. be exact. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so that's, that is not always the way to tell because <laughs> sometimes like I cut another piece of this palm sedge here and it was round. So that, yeah. this is just like um, one of the first steps to yes. uncovering. And sometimes rushes have edges too. <laughs> it's all complicated, yeah, right? They no, no hard and fast rules, just no, guidelines. That's right. So sedges of edges, rushes are round. So here I have this green piece is uh, a, a rush. It's soft rush, juncus effer, effusus? effusus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, unlike grass here, this is uh, a, a piece of um, prairie ochre or prairie feather, golden feather, whatever. Golden feather, yeah, Informally sure. Informally in, in grass. Notice the node here on the, the brown piece here. This is the grass. That is indicative of it being a grass and not a rush. Whereas a rush is smooth all the way from the base to the tip. And this grass has nodes, also joints or elbows, however you want to kind of visualize that um, all the way up the plant. So that's your first way to kind of see what am I looking at when I'm looking at these beautiful green clumps of feathery texture, right? <laughs> so uh, we'll start here, actually, we mentioned um, palm sedge. So this is a bit of the dry um, remains. So it's about, what, 16 inches tall, give or take, maybe 18 inches. And I really like how it looks during winter time. Um, and before we got all that snow, it was standing pretty well upright. And it's here in kind of a shadier area. I would say this is a part shade situation it's getting morning sun but definitely shaded by afternoon and um, we haven't cut this back yet but we probably will soon um, but you can see the new foliage is already starting to come up here and as the common name indicates palm sedge it does kind of have like a palm frond appearance um, yeah I think this is a great grass and I think uh, textured things <laughs> textured things uh, grasses, sedges, and rushes are, are often overlooked in garden design because they don't have the really like bold blooms, but you'll be surprised, or maybe not, but a lot of our grasses and sedges do actually bloom. They all do. They all do. And I just remembered one that we, we are not going to talk about, or we're not going to specifically mention today, but I'm going to specifically mention it now, is gray sedge, oh, which gray has, sedge. speaking of like very characteristic seed heads, the flowers on it are amazing, but not too showy, but the seed heads have those really spiky, like mace-like. Yes, yes. So they've, yeah. they've got really some nice visual interest up top, whereas some sedges, when they, actually the next sedge we're going to look at, when it yeah. flowers, you don't really see the seed head too much after. Yeah, and you know, that, that brings up a really good point, Al, and, um, with, uh, with sedges and grasses and rushes, one of the easiest ways to identify them is by the bloom. Um, cause Otherwise, they all kind of look like blades of grass. No offense right. to, to my sedge friends. <laughs> yes. We just did this right before we started filming. It's confirming IDs based on blooming and sedges. A lot of sedges will be blooming at this time of year. And that that works for them because... Sydney, do you want to talk about why <laughs> why it works? <laughs> well, when they, they're blooming when maybe not too many pollinators are out quite yet. Right, and that's not a problem for these plants because they're actually wind pollinated. Yeah. Um, and something I learned during Planet Native at Shannon Curry's Sedge Talk from Izell Nursery is that sedges are cool season plants. Mm -hmm. So you'll see most of the growth happening here in early spring. Um, and then again later... Um, maybe in the fall if it gets another burst of 
Yeah, so we, I, I did want to mention that too with palm sedge. Sometimes it gets, it kind of loses its luster and some of the sedges can be like this too and you can end up cutting them back kind of later in the season when we're out of drought um, warning, you know, and um, get them to kind of refresh once again in the spring. Yeah. So let's, what do we have? Let's take a closer look at this. We've identified this plant as Pennsylvania sedge and um, just get in down there yeah. on that little... Um, deal here so um, you can see the blooms look how beautiful and cute they are they're so tiny uh, but yeah so I was amazed when I learned that grasses and sedges and rushes all bloom too because I don't know I just never thought about it right never thought about these little tiny cute things having <clears throat> blooms um, especially when we don't you know they're not they, grasses and things like that don't come up very often for pollinators but a lot of these are actually host plants uh, for right. a lot of our moths and butterflies and, and beetles and even leaf hoppers. So um, I think that's a wonderful reason to consider adding things like sedges and grasses and rush to your landscape. Not only are they beautiful, but they do support wildlife. That's right. And now we're going to show you real quick something that's not any of those things. <laughs> it's not a grass, a sedge, or a rush. But it's easy to... Um, it's easy to think that it might be. So <laughs> we're looking here. <laughs> oh yes. And I'll so actually, I'll do you want? It over yeah. To... So uh, when we're talking about some plants that are coming up early in the season um, that you might want to ID, especially if you live in Kansas City. I know you got this plant in your yard already. So that's this one right here. <laughs> and uh... oh, look how easy that oh came my out! God, wow. Wow. It's like someone already pulled it out before we started filming. That's crazy. <laughs> So this is called Star of Bethlehem, and it's got a really sort. It kind of looks like a, a sedge or a grass. I mean, I, actually, it probably is. No, it's not. It's a flower. It's a flower. So it's got um, a flat leaf that's kind of glossy. So a little bit looks like wild onion, which is also coming up right now, and is a really tasty wild edible. But you don't want to confuse these because this plant is very toxic, and it also has bulbs kind of like the wild garlic so it can be easy to confuse them if you don't remember that wild garlic and wild onion has a round leaf with no mid white mid vein this light colored mid vein going down the flat leaf mm. and it doesn't smell like onion or taste like onion either so this one's toxic don't eat this one <laughs> but it does have really beautiful little flowers and so that's how it started creeping around um, because people planted it for those beautiful white little flowers that'll be blooming soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's that's good to know. Um, and we, we definitely encourage you to eat your weedies. Yeah. Uh, but make sure you know what they are before you get into I it. <laughs> okay. And we have a couple more friends over yes, here. Can I talk about? Yeah, let's do it. So, um, we have a couple examples here. One that you've already met. Here's a, another palm sedge. And just look how adorable it is, even with its winter haircut, winter coat, if you will. Um, I think it looks beautiful. So I like leaving that up in the winter for winter interest and also habitat for overwintering beetles. But then over here, we have one that you may all recognize, maybe not, uh, if you have a yard and you have Ooh. some shade, take a look and see if you find uh, this big clump here. This is actually Carex blanda, which is white tinged sedge. I think I said that right. And this is one you would not find um, sold at a nursery, but it is one you, you'll see popping up in your backyard. I actually love these. I think they are underutilized. Um, and if they are in a place already in your landscape that fits your goals in terms of like visual interest or ground cover, um, even overwintering habitat for small birds, then consider leaving it because it's it's kind of sweet, isn't it? And look how it's big great. it is. I it's, mean, it's so kind big. Of a showpiece. I know this right one here. is this one is an extra special buddy that yeah. really got so nice and showy. Really um, I think with Carex, what, what, what do you call it? The um, Eastern Woodland Sedge oh, also, because right. you'll woodland see sedge, this plant. Yeah. It's very native to Kansas City. It will just show up on its own and yeah. Sydney's sniffing some Minarda back there. So we kind of let it in this bed. It's got some pretty healthy competition from things 
things like Monarda, River Oats, there's a few Coreopsis in this bed also. So it's not really an issue that you're um, that we've given it a lot of space here and it, <laughs> it's a specimen. It's, it's a, a specimen, specimen. Look for how beautiful sure. it is. Yes. Very cool. This one you won't be able to buy in a nursery, although I I don't, I'm I don't know, I haven't seen it for sale in nurseries. It's, but it's very common, so it will just show up on its own. Yes. Um, okay, okay, so we're going to head to the prairie. So, oh, yes. I want to mention also sedges, you can consider them to be more woodland type species, typically. They uh, prefer shade, they prefer cooler sun, so most of our sedge species here um, don't love full sun, they, they don't love the hot afternoon sun hitting them. So if you have a woodland type situation in your landscape consider sedges for ground cover oh gosh, for absolutely. visual interest for for food and cover for wildlife yeah they're they should be a part of every native plant garden <laughs> and again i can't i can't stress just how the visual aspect of it too um you'll see lots of designs native landscape designs nowadays that utilize sedges like oak sedge mm -hmm. uh, oak sedge see that here. My, one of my favorite sedges which we actually don't have in the landscape here so we're going to add it to the gardens this year That's yes my goal. Um, um texas sedge too i just wanted to mention yeah. very briefly that there's texas been a lot sedge. of where <laughs> texas sedge there it is <laughs> that um i wanted to mention briefly that they there's been a lot of research and, and people trying to figure out what could be a good native lawn replacement. And I think sedges are coming up. The issue with sedges is that they're they're pretty hard to reprodu reproduce. So it's hard to get a bunch of them. There's right. some sedges that only make like three seeds a year and you gotta be there on that one day when they're right before a bird eats them. Yes. So that's the difficulty there. But I think there are some other, there are some sedges they're working on that are more full sun and short. So cool. they would be like good yard replacement sedges too. I that. Yeah. Uh, folks, you may be familiar with buffalo grass, which is a grass, um, not a sedge. It really hates shade. It will die at any little bit of shade cover. Yeah. Shade cover. Um, but there's lots of options that are. And it looks like maybe our side oats. Don't have, have they been any, eaten? Don't have <laughs> now your native plant garden isn't working if it's not all chewed up That's by the true. end of the year. So, so these... it's nice that we're not finding any seeds, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Here's like three. <laughs> yeah. Again with those three little. Seeds. Oh, and they're held together by spider webs, which oh, is hilarious. Cute. So I don't know if you can see that, but um, so this is a, a little clump forming, sun loving grass, Cytos grama, Budalua curtumpendula. And yeah, and that's not a that's not a coincidence. They're all on one side. This grass is so easy to ID. Right, the, the side this... oats they hang off. Um, they have these really gorgeous red blooms when they are blooming, um, and they they're not super prolific. Um, they will spread eventually by seed, but who doesn't love that? Um, so you can see here, um, this is more of like a savanna situation in this section of Primrose Prairie. But they're still doing great. These three were planted in 21, and they look happy. So, um, and also the it's other... It's such a good grass for, like... I know sometimes people can be maybe a little intimidated. Hi. Oh, there's a friend. Hi. I'm not... Okay, so a couple hours have passed since we saw a snake and got distracted. But here we are. We're back. Um, so I wanted to... We just talked about Bulua... <laughs> Curtum pendula, which is the side oats grama, which is not grandma sideways, it's actually graminoids, which are grasses. And um, this one is eyelash grass. So I actually have a couple species here, Primrose Prairie of Budalua, uh, three of them. Um, this one is Budalua hirsuta, also known as hairy grama, not hairy grandma, <laughs> hairy grama, um, or eyelash grass. And as the common name indicates, it looks like a little false eyelash. There's also another species called Budalua gracilis, and um, if you tuned into the Last Bluffs episode, you know that the difference um, between the two has to do with the formation here on the tip. Um, cue the image here, me showing you what that <laughs> looks like. Um, <laughs> so that's the main difference there. Um, but yeah, so this is a wonderful, again, clump forming, full sun species. Um, it does spread uh, pretty easily from seed, but it's not overly a, a prolific or anything like that. So I really like it. Um, in this garden, we will be cutting this vegetation back here soon. Prairie plants or full sun species do not love to have a ton of vegetation on top of them. Um, some of our species like little blue stem will get root rot. 
Uh, we even heard from Merv Wallace at Missouri Wildflower Nursery that um, he's noticed in prairies where the little where it hasn't been burned for a few years, um, some of the little blue stem is affected to the point where it won't seed for a couple years after that. So really important to understand the plants, um, where what they prefer, um, and different management techniques for them. So when you're talking about your prairie plants and your bunching grasses specifically, we're thinking about some of the habitat that those can provide to things like beetles, like snakes for instance, that beautiful garter snake that we saw before beautiful. was totally just hanging out in this sweet little clump of grass. So when you're working with those, you just want to remember, make sure, maybe wait for those warmer days like we have today to clear those out because those snakes are going to be able, those snakes, those reptiles, the um, invertebrates, are, they're are all going to be able to find shelter um, when you're cutting back right here. <laughs> you're looking for him again. I He's am, like, I'm, I'm gone. gone. I find my friend. Um, we have but... such a great community of garter snakes here and they love us. Obviously they we give do. them plenty of they things to eat. They and... don't love when I pick them up and want to kiss them. <laughs> they do love it here. Yeah, um, yeah. So in addition to habitat for wildlife, because people often, since since the blooms are not um, as showy on grasses as they are with our herbaceous forbs, um, like which are flowers, right? Um, they uh, people just often overlook them for pollinator benefits, but they are host plants for a lot of our insects. So um, Alex mentioned habitat for beetles, but also um, there's lots of butterflies, moths, skippers. Um, and other uh, leaf hoppers, stink that, bugs. Stink, stink bugs. <laughs> if you're well, a stink well, bug stink fan, bugs, that's right. They love it. Um, they rely on it. So you know, host plants. It's the the food that they need in order to grow up. Um, and a lot of them are pretty specialized. So um, I was pretty surprised by that. Um, I know with like um, Indian grass, there's the pepper and salt. A butterfly that is yes. the host to it, which I think is adorable. Yeah, and one of Carrick's we talked about earlier is a host to the skipper, the Delaware skipper. Oh, so cool. <laughs> butterfly. So, so that's neat, right? So not only um, is it habitat, is it food, uh, it's also beauty in your landscape. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the big four prairie grasses and a couple of their lookalikes too. You've probably heard the term big four when you're talking about a prairie ecosystem. There are four main grasses that you're definitely gonna find. And the first one we have here, just barely hanging on, this is our big blue stem, Andropogon gerardii. And this is the tallest of our um, big four prairie grasses. And this, plant I don't find very useful in a native plant setting very often. There are a few instances where you can pull it off maybe at the way back of a garden but kind of one of the reasons we have this planted in this prairie circle right here is to keep it sort of contained because when you have a prairie planting or a native plant garden it's very easy for them to become overrun with grasses because in a, a, a chaotic system grasses are usually the ones to seed more than the forbs and kind of outcompete the forbs. So this one is a beautiful grass to have, a very important grass to have, but not something you find very often in a formal sort of garden setting. So we like to give it its little little areas to have. It's got seven little circles here, so it's very well <laughs> represented. <laughs> and uh, did you point out how tall it is? I mean, yeah. So that's what how I'm tall are five you? Five nine. And five so, nine. It's like yeah, six this, feet tall. Yeah. Yes. And and uh, with our big pra for our prairie grasses and a lot of our plants. We have um, really nice soil here and a little more rain than most prairies do. And so a lot of our plants will express uh, much taller than they would on the prairie. <laughs> so little big blue stem isn't quite <laughs> this tall out in the wild. Yes. But when you give it everything that it wants and no competition, it can get a little um, <laughs> large. <laughs> and then large and in charge. A little large Please material. Do. So here's one that y'all are probably already familiar with. This is little blue stem and uh, Schizochirium scoparium. And this one is very, very common on our tall grass prairies. And one of my favorite things is when Merv comes to the Discovery Center for Missouri Wildflower Nursery, he can tell which areas the little blue stem are from because we've gotten all of our plants from him. And some of them express themselves very differently. This one, what would you say? This one's less fluffy. This oh, one's really tall. Well, yeah, I was going to say, most of them have lost their their fluffiness already, but yeah. this one definitely 
has a large presence, kind of like big blue stem. Yeah. It's well, it's a larger little blue. The tallest little blue I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> Definitely. Here. Yeah. But yeah, so this is another very important uh, species for the tall grass prairie. It's um, seed and forage for a lot of wildlife and again a lot of habitat in this grass too. This grass is much easier to use in a formal landscape. It, it should be, it could, can be used in a prairie bed sparingly though because it does spread pretty pretty prolifically. Yeah, if uh, I think I've made recommendations before to folks like uh, if you were to do a combination of grass and flowers in your bed um, I think I've recommended like a 70% forb, which is flowers, to a 30% grass, just yeah. with how prolific they can be. Um, but again, just like sedges we talked about earlier, using grasses to plant in a matrix, like a grid, and then fill out other uh, yeah. blooming species around it is a great, great yeah. thing to do and visually this, and this specific, wildlife. This, this little section right here, this uh, little bluestem is supporting uh, Princeton and Cobea, which is... Um, Big purple, uh, what's it called? Big, big purple, big purple. <laughs> it's a purple fox glove. Oh my gosh, that was like two bros. Yeah, there we go. Um, um, and it also supports Blazing Star, which Blazing Star famously needs support buddies to hold it up because it can, uh, if it's on its own, it, it can get too tall. It's a flopper. It's a flopper. Okay. Oh, then, well, actually, let's show uh, this one the prairie ochre. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a plume. It's pluming. It's pluming. <laughs> pluming and blooming. So tell us about this. Yeah, so this is Sorgastrum mutans. It used to be called Indian grass, and we call it prairie ochre or prairie golden. Golden flame, prairie golden feather. Golden prairie fe feather, whichever name you like. And it, um, this grass has a very um, distinct um, hairs on the ends of the seeds here. That's kind of the big difference. I think and the plume is is um, all one piece like that instead of the seeds going up the stem sort of the way little blue stem is so with uh, with prairie ochre it's got these fluffy seeds here and this is another this is the other this is the third uh, tall grass prairie grass of the big four another very important species but again you don't want a monoculture of it you don't want it to um, spread too rapidly in a native garden setting I haven't honestly I haven't seen it used very well in native garden settings um, it's it's uh, very prolific and I wouldn't recommend yeah. planting it in with your little baby forbs um, especially not as a support grass for any of those taller forbs um, it's just gonna it's just going to outcompete them so something that we've done um, in the landscape here to kind of help manage um, the prairie ochre or prairie feather whatever you want to call it um, it by by cutting the seed heads off before they even go to seed so yeah. you'll see the stalk come up um, it's round it's got a sheath around the around the seed head and we just go around and trim them back it's yeah. not going to kill it but it's for us like we don't necessarily manage for it but we don't want it to spread more it's yeah, yeah so I can and then the seeds can spread pretty far in yeah the too, so um, okay, and then All the right. last one is I don't we don't really have a great example of this, so I'll just talk about it while we're walking to Broom Sedge. But this one, the the fourth uh, tall grass prairie grass is switchgrass, um, uh, panicum. It's a panic grass, uh, so it means it has panicles as the seeds. So you'll see there's there's one yeah, that one's a not straight native, so it's not, not a exactly true native. Like this, but this is kind of what the seed head looks like at this point in the year. This is a cultivar um, of some yeah. kind. But I wanted to speak on those really quick because uh, one of our worst invasive species in the Kansas City area is called Johnson grass. And you all have probably seen this before. And it looks very similar to switchgrass, but Johnson grass has a very uh, distinct white midrib on the leaf. And maybe we, we can throw a picture in there of side Boop. by side switchgrass and Johnson grass. So Johnson grass is bad, switch grass is good. Do we want to talk about broom sedge a little bit? I do. Okay. Okay, so here's our broom sedge. Um, it, out in the landscape, and I don't know if this will pick up on camera very well, um, but with my eyes, um, I think the color of broom sedge is like a orange gold. It's very bright. It's so beautiful. 
it's so beautiful it's even brighter than the little blue stem when it's um you know in its winter colors i'd say little blue stem is more like a red brown yeah the one over there is kind of a purplish reddish yeah brownish, but, but again maybe like abstract for you all to see um but anyway, so here's broom sedge. Um, so I actually was, um, I've seen this, you know, growing out in the landscape. And our friend Courtney Masterson, um, I was reaching out to her just to get a little more insight because I know she's familiar with this plant. And uh, she said, though it is native to Kansas and Missouri, um, for, for her and like the large landscape work that they're doing uh, to restore native landscapes is um, they notice this plant when there's a lot of disturbed sites. Um, in the landscape, so they're kind of an, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Indicator species, if you will, it, it, to some extent. Just to show you, like, okay, here, this, uh, that area was probably grazed or tilled, or it's got something going on with it that yeah. is more, um, more disturbed and less, uh, yeah. high quality. So you wouldn't, yeah, so you wouldn't see, like, a ton of broom sedge on a remnant. You would never right. see that. Yeah, so. but it, it's a, a great plant for the native garden, so. Yes, I, I almost say, like, it's in competition with little blue stem. Now, don't plant it maybe the first year, maybe wait a year or two and let your forbs sort of establish first before you add this plant in, but just huge masses when we talk about planting swaths of plants having a big swath of broom sedge and there's just nothing more beautiful it's, it's gorgeous still standing now even yeah look how upright so rain, rain yeah. snow i mean snow. it stands up to the four or five nice. inches of thick snow we had yes. so i think it's pretty awesome it's just beautiful. consider adding some texture to your garden okay now we're okay. gonna move very quickly because we just have a couple more things <laughs> okay. Okay. so we've talked about sedges we've talked about grasses well we're gonna talk about one more sedge <laughs> Um, oh yeah. So I, I think I got it. Yeah. So here we have this little cutie patootie. Uh, we got two cuties here. We not a not a grass or a sedge, but we have a uh, common violet right there. Yes. And then we have a little cedar sedge here. So we're underneath a what is this, a little pit, a little oak. Did you see it made babies? It did make babies. It might be a spirite. It might be. So, um, this is the first time I've had good luck with this plant. It's got more babies on the other side, too. So that's cute. So it looks happy. It's spreading. So just to give context to where we are, we're underneath a big, or little, rather, little oak. A medium oak for Medium us. oak. A little tiny oak. And um, we planted lots of spring ephemerals in here. We've got Jacob's Ladder popping up. I mentioned there's violets up here. Um, and all kinds of good stuff, but the cedar sedge has the, probably the most delicate hair-like um, texture of all of our sedges, and it does really well in this part shade, well, part sun situation now. I would say, yeah, this is definitely, well, this is part shade because uh, it doesn't get afternoon. So. It is right. Well, in the early spring, it's part sun, and then when, yeah. the, when it leaves out, it's part shade. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's doing great. You can tell the soil, well, maybe you can't tell. The <laughs> soil is very uh, nice it over is. here. It's pretty rich, and it's done great. Uh, I, think I don't think it rained last night. It's still it didn't. Rain. Yeah, the leaves are really keeping it moist. So this is also another reason to leave your leaves, especially in your woodland areas. Look at that. Like Jacob's Ladder, none of these species are having issues popping up under the leaf litter. The selenine poppy. Selenine poppy. Hello, what's Hello. up? Hello. So yeah, I'm feeling like really good. Oof, we're getting old. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was embarrassing for me too. Um, anyway, we're yeah. we're looking forward to um, seeing the spring plants come up through the leaf litter. That's right, and we do have one oak. Now this oak doesn't do it as much, but pin oak, which is where this. Pinno Cove is where you'll find our spring ephemerals. <laughs> we got I'm not getting distracted. I'm not <laughs> getting distracted. Fine. But um, this area gets heavy, heavy leaf cover. And uh, okay, maybe one distraction. Okay, maybe one little blood root. Look at the blood root blooming. Oh it's so it's so been blooming cool. for about a week now. You can oh. see those have already finished blooming. The May apples are coming. And the next. May apples are next. So anyway, spring ephemerals. But this is a grass episode. Yes. Yeah. But it's nice to have this bare. You can see the bare earth under here. That's really letting those blood roots pop up a little bit. And so, in a natural forest that was managed with fire. Um, the way that they would have been in the past. Um, the spring ephemeral game is on point right after that fire because they got all the room. If you want to check it out, go to Rocky Point Glade, which was burned this year, and check out the spring ephemerals there. And they just stand out so 
nicely. I'm, I'm saying, what I'm saying is sometimes we leaf blow this area to give the spring ephemerals a little bit more room. Yeah. Because they get really heavy packed down leaves. They, they don't necessarily They want certainly can't. Yeah. So there is definitely a balance. But yeah. um, as you saw, they also don't have very much issue coming up through. But now here, so, yeah. this is pretty thick. I was thinking here where we place the trout really, you know, they may need to Look at that. That's... That's like, well, let's find out. Let's see. So There's a river. It's coming back up. Yeah. But yeah, this is like <laughs> a few inches of leaf litter. Yeah, but this has everything to do with the traffic that's on this site and the wind and, and what kind of tree. Uh, the kind of tree with where you're going to leave your leaves is really important too because the oak tree, the leaves break down a lot slower than some other kind of leaves too. And so there's, you know, years and years sort of masked up in some areas. Yeah, definitely. Ideally, we would set fire to the whole thing and take care of it. <laughs> yes. And just to keep in mind that, that your native garden is a, is a managed habitat. That's your, that's your habitat that you're managing. And so keeping these things in mind where you might need to replace a natural event or something, say like snow or rain mm -hmm. or trample, you may need to replicate that somehow in your garden to get some of these special plants. Definitely. I like thinking about it in that way. It's like, what were the natural what systems? The what were the natural <laughs> systems? What's yeah. what's now missing? And how can I help? Right. All right, y'all. We're here by the pond. And, the and, and frogs. The frogs are out. They're having a great time. So what are we talking about here? Okay. So here we have one of our rushes. And you showed that earlier. I don't see it. We're not quite flowering on the rushes yet, but... You can see how the rushes are round, so they're always going to be, not always, but <laughs> I, I talked about bulrush, which looks triangular a little bit, but rushes are typically going to be round with no joints, the way grass um, has the joints or the nodes down the blade, so just one solid blade there. And um, these will flower, they have a really fun little pop of flower, kind of a pom-pom looking thing on the end for the soft rush yeah and it's um, where it's growing right now here on this edge so it, it's it's a wet yeah. wet species right yeah yeah which is we so we try to represent all ecosystems in missouri here at the discovery center and this is the trickiest one to pull off obviously because <laughs> we don't have any real natural water here but our pond lends lends itself to a lot of these species especially our floating wetlands you can see right here which are kind of just turtle basking <laughs> islands, but also they have a lot of rushes and are wetland species that cannot handle even uh, being planted on land. They need to have uh, pretty solid wet feet mm -hmm. most of the year. Some of our irises, some of our cardinal our flower. Yeah. Actually, our cardinal flower, the, it only blooms uh, on our islands here. Yes, right? it, we <laughs> can't yeah, get it to bloom anywhere else. <laughs> in wetter spots in the garden. And yeah. So yeah, if you have a wet spot, maybe consider adding this to your yes, landscape. Rushes, especially in water gardens. Oh my God. Rushes in like standing water gardens or very ornamental um, water catchment uh, situations. That the rushes would be a great awesome. Um, and I think that, you know, there's more and more rushes that are becoming commercially available as well. Yes. I'm appreciating that for sure. Yeah. Okay. We have one more friend to talk about. Okay. Let's rush over there. <laughs> Um, I really enjoy seeing in a very urban setting um, because it, you can use it to fill in weird little gaps and have a monoculture uh, wherever there's building water coming down. Yeah, so it's, like that maybe. See the rain spout here. Come up the pavilion. And boop, here we are. Here we are. Let's see if I can get over here. So I'm not blocking it. Okay, so tell us about this little tubular friend okay. that is both round and has joints. Right? What? Wouldn't you think this would be a grass rush? <laughs> a rushing grass? So, yes, yeah, so this is one of the common names. We call it horsetail here, but one of the common names is scouring rush, but it's not a rush. It's actually a fern. Can you believe that? A fern. Prehistoric so, fern. Yes, this is one of the oldest plants we have in Missouri. You can find this, this one in the fossil record way back. So this the OG. is called scouring rush because it has a lot the stem contents have a lot of silica in them and so if you if you gather a bunch of them and sort of 
um, make a little like broom you can make a scrubby brush to yeah. wash things with or to sand things it would use it as fine sandpaper too and this plant is a really good um, standing water plant it really loves standing water but it can handle some drier situations too we've seen it on some kind of dry creek beds actually mm -hmm. in Kansas City you'll sometimes find little patches of it if you go down south you'll find a lot more patches of it in um, along riparian areas mostly but it's done really well in this little circle we have to cut it back every once in a while but it's fun to use for programs and it's just a really really interesting plant it puts out instead of a flower it puts out spores so it's got this really funky looking little spore um angia angia <laughs> what'd you call me i don't know thing <laughs> on the top um, cool and yeah it's one of my favorite little plants of missouri it's got a lot of a lot of stuff going on it really does. I think it's it's very cool, I, and it it's stays. Kind of like bamboo. It looks like it bamboo, does. It kinda. looks like bamboo. It stays semi evergreen for the most part. Yeah. Um, I even see it utilized in like full sun, like ditches, like in uh, northeast Kansas City. There's a whole area where oh, they nice. have like on the edge of their side of the road, um, yeah. and it's all this. So it can handle. It seems like it can handle pretty extreme situations. Yeah. It but, is a clump, uh, not clump forming, but it 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 rhizomes. will, it will uh, spread and by itself. You can see how look tight that. all the roots are down here. Someone set this on fire at some point, but the um, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is all just really tightly packed in. So you would never want to plant horsetail in like we're talking about with formal gardens. This wouldn't be a good plant. No, to have it's a good it. monoculture. Though. It is. We don't. We never say. <laughs> we, we never say that about. Never anything, have we but ever. That is a good monoculture. <laughs> All right. So, well, shall we jump into the Q&A? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you everyone so much. I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as I did. Um, if you couldn't tell, Alex and I have a ton of fun working together in the landscape. And I'd like to welcome her onto the screen. Hey, Alex. So everyone, um, you remember Alex? Hello, everyone. <laughs> so we're gonna jump into the Q and A, and Alex, as Hello. our guest speaker, uh, that video was great. Yeah. Oh, I think your uh, internet connection might be a little lagging. So I'm gonna ask you a couple questions through our Q and A, and I'll give you a chance to respond. So we have such a exciting conversation happening in both the chat and Q and A. So. We're going to jump right into it because we only have a little bit of time left. And whatever questions we don't get to, we will, um, Alex and I will work on those, getting those answers over to you in the when I email you the resources. Okay. Amy is asking for ideas of low maintenance, neat, well behaved grasses and sedges for some of the common areas of the HOA. The community is currently um, turf grass lawn addicted, which we, I think we've all seen pretty often. Um, but we have a couple of locations in our common areas that are bare. So I'd like to see if some native grasses might be planted there. So I think um, if you want to maybe suggest a few species, that would be awesome. Could be even ones we covered today. Oops. Okay. Looks like Alex is having some connection issues. So I'll go ahead and answer this while she gets reconnected. Um, so a lot of the plants we talked about today would be great. So you first need to figure out the sunlight situation. If it is shady, um, you might try some sedges like oak sedge is a pretty common one. Same with Pennsylvania sedge. Um, and in terms of grasses, um, Alex, what do you think about grasses for, um, an HOA type situation? Yeah, sorry, I lost you there. Um, if you were talking about, yeah, HOA grasses, I think that sedges are the way to go for sure. Um, uh, and you probably just mentioned this, but the Boodaloo's also. Um, if I'm thinking of neighborhoods with um, HOAs, unfortunately, I'm usually picturing um, neighborhoods that don't have very many trees and probably do have mostly those yeah those shorty cute boodaloo so many to choose from and um uh, an oak okay um alex i'm so sorry your internet connection is not working 
um it, it keeps cutting out and is choppy so I think um I'm so sorry, sorry. it's okay um bye <laughs> I'm gonna move on quickly and Alex will help with the Q and A uh, later, and I'm so glad Alex was able to join us for that video portion because she's very knowledgeable with her Missouri native species of grasses, sedges, and rushes. Um, so moving on to questions, Ash is asking about river oats. So we didn't cover river oats too much today, um, but it is one of those prolific plants, and just like with any species that you're trying to uh, manage the the seed dispersal. Um, that's, that's the way to do it. Right. Cause that's, uh, river oats does spread rhizomatically, but helping cut back the seed before it drops will be helpful. Um, but also, I mean, you may have to consider some different manual options since they do spread into like a colony. Um, but try cutting by hand in the meantime. Uh, Val is asking if Carrick's Blanda is deer resistant. It's volunteered generously in their garden and they might use it to edge and discourage deer. Yeah, I think if you're already noticing that it's already in your space, um, I think go for it. I haven't noticed deer preferring it. I think usually they're looking for anything that's tender green shoots. So that makes sense. Um, a few of you have asked about when to cut back grasses and sedges. And I just wanted to comment on this briefly. Um, so with sedges, like the palm sedge you all saw at the very beginning of this episode, it has both the green growth coming up already and dead uh, vegetation hanging from the top. So now could be a good time to go in with some hand pruners and just lightly trim back the dead material. Now we are just in the start of spring. So this really depends on your gardening goals. Um, in some areas at the Discovery Center, we have started cutting back material, but that's because we have nine acres to cover and only a handful of staff to do it. Um, and like in the gardens here at my place, like I still have vegetation, like I have my dry grass is still in place. Um, so I would just say be strategic based on what you're trying to accomplish. We do have some colder days in the forecast coming up here in Kansas City. So I'm trying to be selective about leaving habitat for animals and wildlife to stay warm and also get ahead on some other tasks. So um, kind of keep that in mind. But typically you can cut back your grasses and sedges and things like that um, pretty low. Prairie drop seed in our formal garden is a great example of this. We cut it back a couple of weeks ago, like all the way back, and it has brand new fresh growth coming up. So, um, and you can always experiment a little bit uh, in your garden and see what works best too. Okay, so speaking of prairie drop seed, uh, first time attendee to Native Plants at Noon, welcome Jim. We, um, you have a question about prairie drop seed that's been in a place for three seasons now, and it hasn't grown more than about six inches tall. They don't seem happy. They're in full sun. Thoughts on what I need to do. Okay. So we have prairie drop seed in a couple locations at our garden. I mentioned the formal rock garden, which is along the sidewalk on the south side of the discovery center. And it is, um, it has a liner, like um, a landscape liner. So that location is actually fairly wet. Um, and then the other location we have it is in the squares right at the front entrance of the center, which is surrounded by concrete and seems pretty dry, but it's really dense. So my guess is that um, maybe, I'm, I'm curious about how much water it's getting. It is a full sun species. Um, but I would be curious what else is going on around there. Um, they also may need to be cut back. That is something uh, Alex talked about um, and myself in this today's episode, how prairie species often don't like a lot of vegetation remaining on top of them um, in the growing season. It, it smothers them. It can lead to root rot. So that is, those are my thoughts. Um, I'm guessing it's the latter. Since prairie, prairie drop seed is a prairie species, they're not like a super wet species, but those are just the observations I have. I hope that's helpful. Okay, so we have a lot more questions here in the Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can answer one more before we go. 
And don't fret if your questions don't get answered today. We will follow up in our resources. Uh, and please take a moment to fill out the survey that will be included in that resource to let us know how we've done today. All right, so last question. Um, Michelle is asking about planting Blazing Star to support grasses um, because she's saying that their Blazing Star definitely flops. Um, I've been there myself. So Alex is mentioning um, the value of having plants with different root morphology and morphology is the shape of said thing. <laughs> and in this case, we're talking about roots. So blazing stars and liatrices have corms, which look like little bulbs, somewhere in between like a bulb and a carrot. It's like a little taproot and they're very delicate. They're also delicious to moles, bulls, and crows. Um, so if you see yours disappearing, that could be why, but because of that shape, um, they're, they're not taking up a ton of surface area horizontally. So by planting grasses, things that have more fibrous root systems, they're going to fill in those gaps. So not only are, is there support beneath the soil, but also above, right? So um, we have, we've got a, ton, a bunch of prairie blazing star coming up in those same prairie drop seed beds I mentioned at the front of the center, we just gave that all a haircut very short and it's going to grow up and look beautiful again this year. But the Blazing Star wasn't planted there, it just showed up. So it really likes to have a tight knit community of other species. Just another great reason to add grasses, sedges and rushes to your garden this year. I think that is all we have time for today. Um, I appreciate you all joining us for today's episode of Native Plants at Noon. As I mentioned earlier, all of our episodes can be found on deeproots.org, and I welcome you to visit our website to check out all of our upcoming programs, and be sure to tune in for our Lunch and Learn series every first Thursday at noon. Like I said, we'll be talking about Cedar Niles with Johnson County Parks and Recreation. I can't wait to see you there. Have a great day.